The Australian Traditional Medicine Society will be holding their functional GI symposium in Sydney on Sunday the 15th of September 2019. This event will focus on specialised integrative and naturopathic approaches to the diagnosis, evaluation and treatment of a variety of GI presentations featuring five experts across a full day of learning. To find out more, go to atms.com.au and click on the events tab. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. Joining us on the line today is Dr. Johan van den Boged. He completed his undergraduate training in South Africa with postgraduate training in the United Kingdom at Cambridge, St. Mark's and Hammersmith Hospitals. In 1998, he was appointed professor and seconded to St. Mark's Hospital, where he held joint positions in the Department of Physiology and as a consultant in the Department of Gastroenterology and Internal Medicine. He's held positions as conjoint senior lecturer and conjoint associate professor with the University of New South Wales and still maintains links with his local university of the Sunshine Coast, Queensland. Dr. Van den Bogert believes gastroenterology is an exciting and important field and has very broad interests, including the study of the microbiome, esophageal pathology, motility disturbances, inflammatory bowel disease, and functional bowel disease. Welcome to FX Medicine, Johan, how are you? Thank you very much, excellent, nice to hear you. When we're talking about the gut community, most of us focus on bacteria, but there's a lot more going on than just bacteria, is that right? It's extraordinary what is going on in the gut and extraordinary, the extraordinary new stuff coming out is, is absolutely amazing. They've very recently described a new complete branch of, of organisms in the gut called the CPR branch. Now, to think about a branch of animals, it's really important that the one branch is the eukaryotic branch, which include, includes plants, animals, all multicellular organisms. Then you get bacteria as a, as a second branch, and then you get archaea, archaea or archaea type of bacteria as a third branch and now the fourth branch is the CPR branch which is a completely different type of bacterial structure mm. it's a tiny bacterium and it's it's it represents 30 to 40 percent of bacterial diversity and we've only recently discovered this and discovered that this is actually present in the gut the the exploration of unique organisms in the gut is is taking off and we're discovering new things every day. If you look at the microbiome literature, there's more than 17,000 publications at the moment and growing, as you, as you say, every mm. day. The microbiome is not simply the gut. It includes seven different types of microbiomes, including the lung, the skin, the oral, the vaginal, the penile. The skin microbiome, for instance, contains 10 million organisms per centimetre of skin. So we are, in fact, host to very common organisms that we've known about for a long time, but we also host to viruses, fungi, and organisms which are completely unknown to science and are only now being discovered. I, I have to ask a question about this CPR branch. Does this include the uh, segmented filamentous bacteria? It's been something that mm. I harp on about in many podcasts. And they, no. they interest me acutely, but they're really hard to culture. All these, all these things are quite difficult to culture. The, the reason microbiome research has become a big thing in the last 10 to 20 years is because traditionally microbiologists culture organisms and look at them on plates. But although these are very robust organisms, they're extremely difficult to culture. So, so when you look through the lens of microbial culture, you see only a fraction of the organisms that are available or that are there. The way that we really look at them now is to look at their genetics and sequence them and do metagenomic analyses 
would then give us the whole picture of exactly what is there. We have learned to culture some of these organisms, but culturing 99% in the conventional way is, is impossible. So every bacterial culture we do looks specifically at, at organisms we can culture, but they represent a small fraction of what's actually going on there. And in particular, these new forms, the archaeas and the, and the CPR branch of organisms, which, which seem to be very important in disease. Every day there is a new discovery in our microbiota, microbiome, um, which we need to take heed of. It just, it, I think it poignantly shows us just how little we know about our gut. But let's delve a little bit into at least something that we know of, and that's you know, the rest of the microbiota not just the bacteria, but the fungi, the bacteriophages and viruses. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how much they comprise, what do we know and what don't we know? So when we look at the organisms in a typical human gut, we know that our bodies have 30 trillion cells and there's approximately 39 trillion, let's say, other cells in our guts. So the, the bacteria and the organisms in the gut outnumber our body cells, and certainly their genes outnumber our body cells by, by a, a hundred to one at least, because each of these has a different genetic component. Viruses are, are viruses and, and phages are filled in the gut, and funguses are also all over in the gut. We have no real idea how these work. We know that that some bacteria control fungi. So, for instance, some of your bacteria will produce products that, that, that suppress fungal growth. But we also know very well that fungi suppress bacterial growth. And that's the basis of antibiotics. So so how these how these organisms interact is is very, very difficult. At this stage, we really only know phenomenology. We know that they are there. We can pick them up and we can say something about their distribution. We can say very little bit about their function. We do do metabolomics where we look at genes expressing function. So we know that, you know, for instance, if there is a gene making a short-chain fatty acid, we can pick that up genetically in the bacteria. We can't do any of that for the viruses and the fungus. And the phages are a, are a completely mm. different group of organisms which make it even more complicated. They sort of parasitize viruses. I mean, fa viruses eating viruses. It's you know, bacteria and, and funguses controlling each other in different ways and all living together in the gut. And more, more importantly, living in different parts of the gut. So your microbiome differs dramatically in your oral cavity, to your stomach, to your small bowel, and then in your colon, where the highest concentration of microbiota are found. But, but there's different gradations of importance of microbiota. So a, a bacterium or a fungus in the lumen of the gut is perhaps less important than a bacterium or a fungus right on the wall of the gut. So you get your, your, your population, which is right next to the mucosa and the mucosal cells and is very intimately associated with the immune cells of the gut. We know that the gut has more immune cells by far than any other organ in the body. So you've got a, a very close interaction between, between organisms that are micrometers away from, from macrophages and, and antigen-presenting cells within the gut, gut lining. And if you reduce that gut lining, then these organisms become get closer and become more dangerous. And if they penetrate the gut, then obviously different things happen. And that's and that's the pathology of of many of these diseases. Inflammatory bowel disease, for instance, one of the important pathologies is that you get bacterial translocation. Also in patients with with hepatic problems, it looks like bacterial translocation going through the gut lining. So the the organisms within the gut lining are also a completely different population and perhaps more important than the population in the lumen. We've got um, a single organism, though, blamed for, say, 
you know, gastric ulcers, um, peptic yeah. ulcers, and that's helicobacter yeah. pylori. Do you see a common culprit or culprits with regards to inflammatory bowel diseases, specifically Crohn's? No, I, I definitely don't. And, and when I, I did some research on St. Mark's, then the, the Professor Cam, who, who was running the research there, he he sort of felt that we have to look for this sort of organism. And the same as with celiac disease, there's a specific protein, a specific key that unlocks the celiac disease, the, the, that's gluten protein. And with helicobacter, for instance, there's a specific organism which unlocked peptic ulcer disease. So we have thought about, is there a specific organism? Is there a specific food type? Is there a specific allergen, the first the first step to Crohn's disease and then all the other things developed from it. But I don't think there'll be one specific organism. I think it's an ex- extremely complex disease which is associated with with genetics, with immunology, with food, with bacteria. But certainly the microbiome is, I think, becoming the more important factor in, in pushing and, and driving the immunology of this disease. But to find one organism absolutely... I would be very surprised. They are organisms that are protective. The Prausnutzi group of organisms mm. that produce anti-inflammatory substances and actually run via the NF kappa system. Now, the NF kappa system is the sort of key molecule in in inflammation and reducing inflammation. And we know that these organisms increase interleukin ten, which is a which also reduces inflammation. So certainly organisms that can can break through the immune system and stimulate immunity, but then also organisms that reduce immunity and work as a natural sort of steroid, if you would. But but the complexity of what's going on there is 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 phenomenal. And if you we only just beginning to understand what bacteria are there. We've got no idea what role viruses and archaea and all these other funny organisms play. Martin Blazer has written a book called Missing Microbes and, uh, some years ago now, and of course he he questions not that Helicobacter is implicated in peptic ulcer disease, but what he talks about is the different strains, and if, you know we're well versed about the um, strain specificity denoting the actions of a bacteria. Let's concentrate on the bacteria at yeah. the moment, and that one Lactobacilli acidophilus code is not the same as another lactobacilli acidophilus code. S- similarly, helicobacter, that, that there's a lot determined by the genes. I think there's the VAG, is it VAG, eh? Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. So are we blaming a whole organism for something that's strain specific and should we ide- be identifying the strains to see if that's the bug that we should be eradicating? I think, I think that's a very good point. I don't think we've We've, I mean, different species of Helicobacter, as we know, and you can get cat-type Helicobacter and Helicobacter helmoni in, in humans, but you certainly do get different strains that have got a different virulence, and we've known that for since the beginning of time, as far as microbiology is concerned. I do think we have the tools now to look at the more dangerous types of strains, and then, but I don't think we we really are at a phase where we can target our therapy. For these different strains, right? I mean, if you if you've got a, 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 it may help us to to determine the aggression of our treatment. So, if you look at Helicobacter pylori, for instance, certain of the strains, and that's been well defined, as you point out, with the VAC, is is that some of these are dangerous and others aren't. And we know that some most people have Helicobacter and they never have a problem with Helicobacter. And there was a fascinating theory advanced by some African or South African gastroenterologists that it is in fact protective because they looked at the African population where right. 95% of the population had helicobacter and almost none of them had gastric cancer or, or ulcers. So so then they sort of provocatively said that maybe it protects against ulcers and cancers. But certainly one helicobacter is not equivalent to another helicobacter. And certainly one Fecalobacterium prasnutsi is not the same as another Fecalobacterium. Right. And definitely one Clostridium is different to another Clostridium, as we know. Yes, absolutely. But how we how we uh, subtyping 
the the many thousands of different species and then looking at the at how they exactly cause dangerous problems and toxins and how you would differentially treat them is going to be is going to be i think not super productive i think if you do find certain organisms like clostridium difficile you will try and eradicate them yeah. and, and without without really being cognizant of exactly how dangerous the strain is. Yeah, maybe a question between dangerous or catastrophic (laughs) (laughs) for the patient, yeah. Um, So let's talk a little bit about uh, gut microbial development. Um, You know, we used to think that the baby was sterile in utero and and that the majority or no, the totality of the baby's microbiome uh, developed from the vagina of the mother. Um, but then there was recent evidence, um, I think uh, University of Madrid, um, showing this enteromammary pathway that the breastfeeding was actually very important in translocation, that there was active transport by monocytes um, of bacteria from the mother's gut through the lymph, through the breast milk into the baby. So what's the understanding now of the development of the microbiome? I think, I think the understanding is that I think in utero we 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 mainly like germ free animals really, and then the minute the baby comes out, it's exposed to this universe of microbial just just extraordinary diversity, and we know for instance that breastfeeding changes the baby's microbiome, vaginal delivery changes the microbiome, home birth changes the microbiome. Caesarean section has a profound effect on the microbiome, mm. but I don't think I don't think we should overinterpret these data, because I think basically your microbiome by about the age of two or three seems to be fairly stable, and it seems to be very similar to the siblings and the people that you grow up with. So what what initiates the microbiome clearly is your first contact as you come out of the uterus, whether that is in a hospital environment or in a tiny hut in a rural community will obviously change it. If one has to choose, let's say, a better microbial signature, it would probably be to be born in the hut having a home birth in a rural African community. Those are the best microbiomes one can have. The worst microbiome you can be born with, I would imagine, would be a cesarean section microbiome where you where you get born into a sterile theater with very little variability of organisms. But that sort of evens out with diet, when you get whole food, when you get weaned off the breast. And I'm not sure that that is fantastically important in the in the bigger picture. I think it is important exactly when babies are weaned. I think it's very important what diet they get. And I think the most important perhaps is is in what sort of sterile environment babies get raised. We know that the more sterile your environment is probably the higher chances of getting inflammatory bowel disease. Uh-huh. The, the, there's been long-term data emerging that the further north you go from the equator, the higher your your incidence of inflammatory bowel disease is, in particular Crohn's disease. And it may be that that it's simply a side effect of if you live in an equatorial, more um, developing country with a rural sort of bias, you get a fantastic microbiome. If you eat African-type food, you get a great microbiome. The worst sort of food you can eat is is the Western-type refined food. And the worst lifestyle you can have is the Western-type, sterile-type lifestyle where you don't, as a baby, get in get involved in the dirt and the chickens and the goats and things like that. So so I think that's an important thing to think about. I think one has to have a varied microbiome and that's and that's achieved by eating a sort of a diet rich in 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 fiber and rich in in sort of natural type foods. Yeah. And there's there's been a very interesting study done with African Americans and African Africans, and the study looked specifically at at cancer, and we know that African Americans have a very high incidence of cancer, and that's been related. The whole cancer 
thinking in bowel cancer has somewhat changed, that it could start with inflammation and that the inflammation could be initiated by an abnormal microbiome. And the African-Americans have a, a quite a poor microbiome. They, they seem fairly dysbiotic, whereas the African-Africans have a fantastic microbiome. Different Africans living in different places, obviously. So yeah. If you live in, in a deeply urbanized environment like Johannesburg, you'd have a very different microbiome to someone living in Tanzania, in a living a sort of a hunter-gatherer lifestyle or living on a on a small farm in Tanzania. But if you then change, if the African and African Americans change their diets to the African African type of diet, which is high in fiber, low in Western sort of processed foods, they can within two weeks change their microbiome into really quite a good microbiome. So microbiome changes with diet and with exposure to things in your environment. It happens quite quickly and it can be profound. And the other side of the coin is the African Africans when they ate McDonald's and drank Coke. Yeah. Their microbiome became horrible. So I think that's 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 interesting. So having a microbiome isn't it's not a life sentence. You can change your microbiome. So a, a baby born by a cesarean section with with perhaps a quite limited microbiome can can as a child get a very good microbiome. Just to follow on from something you said there about latitude, that I mean, that smacks very similarly of the um, the world map of multiple sclerosis. But then, of course, humans are so good at looking at one thing or, or trying to find the one thing that's the culprit. One would immediately think about vitamin D, but it's so much more than that. You just mentioned socioeconomics there is a very important um, part of the difference between African Africans and African Americans. Um, yeah. And of course, there's that really good research from Jeff Leach that showed that you can change your Western microbiome back to a very diverse um, set of organisms by eating the sort of hunter-gatherer lifestyle. And we know about plant-based diets as well. So I, I guess the problem is how, as a clinician, do you sift through all of the data and then help a patient, <laughs> you know, with a with a problem with dysbiosis, which we'll get onto later. I think it's extraordinarily difficult. And I'll give you an example. Uh, I, there was a recent discussion, actually, in an anaesthetic conference, and uh, and I looked at some of the interesting lectures there, and and there was a, a fascinating lecture about microbiome and and functional bowel disease, irritable bowel, and they looked at the FODMAP diet. Ah. Which is which symptomatically we know. So the FODMAP diet is a diet low in sugars, and we we know that sugars generate gas in a bowel, particularly in certain patients. And the enemy of anyone with irritable bowel is gas, because they've got what we call visceral hypersensitivity. So their their bowels are more sensitive to distension than someone without functional bowel disease. If you give people a good FODMAP diet, and there's excellent data for this, you'll see that their symptoms definitely get better. They become less bloated. They've got less pain. They just do much better. But if you look at their microbiome, the FODMAP diet, in fact, makes the microbiome less diverse. And in particular, it stops, it, it reduces the number of firmicutes, which are the good guys. You get good guys and bad guys in the microbiome. So, you know, good organisms are things like Firmicutes and Bifidobacterium. The bad organisms are, for instance, the Clostridium difficile, which causes causes an inflammation and a, and a antibiotic associated colitis. So, a good microbiome is one with lots of these good guys, and a bad microbiome has lots of bad guys. Um, and a good microbiome has got high diversity, and a bad microbiome has got less diversity. When you get born, you've got virtually no diversity, you develop diversity as you get older, and then when you get really old, you get very little diversity as well. So your diversity goes down as you become very old. So you've got to hit the sweet spot of microbial diversity, which you can achieve by diet, but by following an absolutely accepted diet, which we know works in irritable bowel syndrome, we reduce our diversity and more importantly, we reduce the good guys. Mm. So how you marry those two together is actually very difficult. 
D- does that form along the lines of the theories of SIBO, which is the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, that we're actually kind of like giving the bowel a rest, similarly to what happens sometimes with Crohn's treatments, where a sort of, um, let's say, an oligoantigenic diet is given for a while just yes. to rest the bowel? Yes. That's, so that question you've asked is actually quite an exciting question. And when whenever patients say to me, tell me about the microbiome, I say to them, have you got four hours? <laughs> so, so that question is a four-hour answer, but I'll, I'll obviously... We I'm up for it. <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll have all our, our listeners passing out and yawning and things like this. <laughs> so let's, let's focus a little bit on SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. I think it's something, and I was in a lecture three days ago with with an absolute expert, a, a, a colleague of mine called Jake Begwin, who's who's a, a fantastic researcher and a really clear thinker. And there are bacteria in the small bowel. They're much less in the small bowel than in the large bowel. And he said, well, he's not so sure about SIBO and how easy it is to measure it and to treat it. In essence, SIBO, I think, is when you get poor motility or something that affects the motility of the upper small bowel, you get bacterial overgrowth. And that bacterial overgrowth causes fermentation in the small bowel. Normally, fermentation is limited to the large bowel because you've got a high bacterial density in the large bowel. And if you feed the large bowel bacteria sugars that haven't been absorbed, such as inulin, that will then allow them like yeast in a bread that's rising to Mm. make gas and grow. And the theory is that the same thing happens in the small bowel. I think it's something that we've 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 been overcalling lately. I think you do get patients with abnormal populations in the small bowel, but I think it's it's less common, and I think it's quite difficult to document and quite difficult to treat. What we do sometimes find is if you get if you get patients with blind loops. I have recently seen a patient with a large diverticulum in the small bowel, and clearly, right. You know, we know in we get the diabetes. small bowel. Yes, you, so it's, it, it is sometimes seen. Right. So this this patient had prominent diverticular disease in the small bowel, Whoa. and in this very large diverticular pouch, obviously foodstuffs get stuck, and then you get problems there, and you get bacteria growing there, and and that to me. So if you get a a sort of a, a poorly emptying bag of of bowel, then you can definitely get overgrowth there, either with a motility disturbance or some surgical problem in the bowel where you've got a blind loop. And then certainly that that can cause massive bacterial growth in the small bowel. And that would be small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. But but it's been a little bit overdiagnosed, I think, and overemphasized. Um, it's always very difficult to, to know what is colonic pain, what is small bowel pain. Mm-hmm. Uh, how does functional bowel disease work? It's 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 a very complex issue. There was a very interesting picture a little while ago, a video of a nurse at one of the conferences who who was very much into diet and probiotics, and she took industrial doses of probiotics, and they showed her a picture of this this patient taking sixteen or seventeen probiotics three or four times a day. And and the probiotics that there was there was so she flooded her proximal bowel with with so many probiotics that in fact these probiotics like like yeast in a bread just basically exploded in her gut and caused immediate and and pretty dramatic small bowel distension which you can actually see so so you definitely can change your your gut microbiota you can give the small bowel too much to work with, and you can give the colon too much to work with, which leads to fermentation. But yes, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth can be treated. It is an entity, but I think it's probably been a little bit overdiagnosed. And I think it is difficult to diagnose because your small bowel has got quite a lot of bacteria anyway. And of course, how do we test? What, what exactly are we testing when we test when we think we're testing? <laughs> you know, yes, uh, one exactly. of my one of my challenges has always been when we're doing a fecal test. Well, we're testing what's in the feces, not what's in yes. the gut necessarily, nor where in the gut. 
Exactly. So you wouldn't be testing what's in the small bowel. The way we look at SIBO is to give patients stuff that then we then measure the breath excretion. So if the bacteria are being active in the small bowel, they produce gases which we breathe out, and then you can see that the the methane or something that we breathe out comes more quickly. So let's say you give someone a lactulose feed then or some sort of sugar that you give, then you'll see that the the breath excretion is is much quicker if it's in the small bowel than if it's in the large bowel, and that tells us that there's fermentation activity in the small bowel, which would be abnormal. So it is an entity we can measure it, but it's it's not it's not easy to document and now to treat really. If part of the issue of SIBO is that it's the bacteria that normally inha- inhabit the colon growing in the small intestine and we're doing a breath test for something that we're breathing out through our lungs, how do we know that the fermentation has got to do with the bacteria overgrowing in the small intestine rather than, say, the proximal colon? How do we know that it's happening at that point? Well, we, we don't, but it's, it's, we sort of think that if it happens quickly because the, the fermentable substance has to go through the small bowel first. So let's say you get something within 30 or 40 minutes, then it's probably the small bowel, whether, whereas if you get it within an hour or so, it's probably not the small bowel. Right. So, so it's just a time-based thing. So it's got to do with motility. Okay, it's got but to do with motility, and it's very rough. Yeah, because then one of the issues with SIBO is motility. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so... Exactly. I think that's the main issue with SIBO. Right. Is, is reduced motility, which allows overgrowth. Wherever you get any body cavity that doesn't empty if your bladder doesn't empty you'll get an infection in your bladder if your lungs don't empty like in a disease called bronchitis consolidation yeah you'll get infection there so we have to flush things out if your gut doesn't empty you'll get abnormal infection in your gut when we're talking about motility we're talking about knocking out the migrating migrating motor complex i've heard that that's got to do with majorly an infection by campylobacter is that the current thinking of what happens I'm not sure if we really understand how how that works. I think gut motility is is extremely complex. I wouldn't say that would be my candidate for disordered motility. Certainly, not in in most functional bowel diseases. We know that 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 a lot of functional bowel disease is related to an enteric infection, and certainly Campylobacter, which I think is an important enteric infection, post Campylobacter infection. Functional bowel disease is a real entity, and we mm. do see it, and it mm. can last seven to eight years. Mm. And we know that there was this infection of Campylobacter in Canada in a place called Walpole, I think, where they had a fourfold increase of irritable bowel disease up to eight years afterwards. So, yes, Campylobacter is, is, is I think, very important. But gut motility is, is also an extremely difficult and variable thing. I'll give you an example of of how gut motility and 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 visceral hyperalgesia work. So Professor Cam did a study many years ago where he he had we looked at the gut motility of constipation predominant functional bowel disease patients and we saw that they've got very disordered gut motility. To measure gut motility in its entirety is actually very difficult. But then we got I didn't do the study, he did the study. Then he got students to volunteer to not pass stool or wind. And within three days, the students that had withheld the urge to pass wind or stool had identical type of slowdown in gut motility as people with severe constipation and functional bowel disease. So it's something that changes very quickly. And many patients will tell you that. They say when they go on a cruise... Yeah. And they change their diet when they're on holiday with strange people and got to share toilets. Then their gut function and their motility changes completely. So we know it's it's a very variable. It's it's incredibly variable and can change very quickly. What about with regards to personal stress or or perception of stress? I mean, we're talking about hypersensitivity and hyperalgesia. These are poignantly associated with how one feels. You know, do do you tend to see? I mean, I'm going to be pigeonholing people, but you know, personality types uh, that who are more susceptible to SIBO, to IBS, to the uh, functional GI disorders. Well, there's absolutely no doubt. So there's there's an interesting 
there's a brain gut axis and a gut brain axis. Mm. And what I think is going on here is is very, very interesting. And if I if I may, I'm going to speak a little bit about that. But but I once had a long discussion with a with a very good friend of mine, Professor Sorrentino, about Crohn's disease and personality types and depression. And and there's good data showing that when you fix the patient's Crohn's disease, their depression gets better. So is it true that if you if you are burdened by a disease which really affects your quality of life. Irritable bowel disease is a real disease. It's an awful disease. It mm. makes people very, very uncomfortable. And it's it's a it's a disease that causes genuine pain. For instance, if you one of the old tests we did for, for irritable bowel was to pump air into into the patient person's gut. So a very simple test, you take a sort of a bicycle pump and you pump air up the bottom a normal patient without irritable bowel can take, let's say, four, five hundred mils. A patient with irritable bowel, very soon after just one or two hundred mils, they become very sensitive and experience extreme pain. So, it's, if if you've got a condition which everyone tells you is not treatable, mm. which you've never managed to treat, despite medication that you take, despite everything you do, you've still got this problem that's getting worse, that affects your lifestyle, that makes you not able to work, go to school, then it will obviously cause stress. So does stress come first, does stress come second? Mm. I don't know, but I do know that having irritable bowel disease is a is a deeply stressful event. And I'm absolutely sure that it 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 makes it worse. There's no doubt about that. And some of our very good treatments look at reducing stress and, and doing those sort of things. And Professor Cam focuses a lot on that and I think it is extremely important. Johan, you'll be speaking at the ATMS Symposium on Functional GI Disorders uh, on September the 15th, 2019, which I will urge all of our Australian, indeed overseas, if you can get there, listeners, um, to attend that because it's going to be riveting. There was, you know, I've got 20 more questions that I wanted to ask you, but we haven't got time. <laughs> but um, firstly, I'd love to get you back on FX Medicine at some later stage. Would you be willing to do that and we'll cover more? Absolutely. Are we, Excellent. Before we go, can I just quickly say something? About oh, we're not autism? going yet. <laughs> it feeds into this brain-gut axis. So we know that the brain talks to the gut, but we also know the gut talks to the brain. And we know it does it through substances that are made by the microbiome. And we know that it's, it's via the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve, in mm. a sort of a reverse communication, speaks to the brain. Yeah. And... There's been some extraordinary new data that's come out, published in scientific reports and cell, which is genuinely powerful data looking at autism. Now, if you if you look at autism as a disease, it's it it shows us how badly the medical profession has treated patients. So, one of the pioneers of autism, Hans Asperger, as well, obviously was one of the first people. But there was a man called Leo Kenner who who blamed mothers for autism. I don't know if you read that sort of literature. And and he blamed maternal neglect as a cause of autism. Mm. And and can you imagine the, the the awfulness of having a child that's deeply impaired and then and being some, blamed for it? <laughs> some professor telling it telling you that it's your fault because you're not a good mother. Yeah. Which which led to extraordinary treatments and and women and and men with children basically destroying their lives and certainly affecting the lives of the other siblings. Then at some point he realized he was wrong and then he held a, a press conference saying, I absolve all you mothers. I mean, the most extraordinary thing to say after after basically making a dreadful mistake. But now then we've we've had this latest measles thing with with autism, which which is a completely different issue and and very worrying. But it does seem to be that autism is related to the microbiome. And have you have you come across any of that that data? Yeah, I mean the, the burgeoning data, but still early days. Well, yes, but but it's extraordinary data. So in essence, a group in in the USA. I've looked at autistic children, and they took eight, um, 18 or 16 autistic children and saw that these children had no prevotella organisms in their 
in their gut and had a very dysbiotic microbiome. So dysbiosis being a not good microbiome. They then used fecal transplantation and oral fecal fecal sort of intake to to reconstitute the, the bowels of these of these children. And they found extraordinary results. Six or seven of these children completely recovered, whereas eight of the children out of the 16 had severe autism. That went down to three. Whoa. And, and a whole group of these, these kids became com- completely non-autistic, which is really powerful data. But the, the even more interesting aspect of that data, and we see this all over the microbiome, is that they took the, the stool of the autistic patients and gave that to mice and saw that the mice that received autistic patient stool became autistic. It's difficult to measure autism in mice, obviously, mm. but there are certain things that mice do that are very abnormal neurologically. And that you could you could transfer autism to a mouse by wow. by transferring the autistic stool. And this is something that we see all over the microbiome, that you can transfer diseases by transferring stool between a patient and 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 a control to a mouse for instance when you look at at fatty liver disease when you look at alcoholic type of hepatitis if you take the stool of a patient with alcoholic hepatitis and you give it to a mouse and that mouse develops the same sort of hepatitis problem if you feed the mouse alcohol if you take some patients take in a lot of alcohol but don't develop alcoholic hepatitis, they have a completely different microbiome. So the microbiome is driving the alcoholic hepatitis and the microbiome can transfer the alcoholic type of hepatitis phenotype to a different species. And this happens reliably. It's, it's extraordinary data. But for me, the, the, the data on autism is... is is extraordinary because this is a disease that we know very, very little about. There's no way that we know how to treat this disease. It's a very complex disease. And there's there's been a small study, you know, but a very well designed study showing definite differences and a transfer transferability of a phenotype. Yeah. It's extraordinary. And back, which is really important. So it's not exactly. just re- it's yeah. not just reversing it, but causing it. So you can show a, a sort of cause and effect relationship. You'll be speaking about fecal transplants at the ATMS Functional GI Symposium in September 2019. What other things will you be covering there? Well, I, I'm just going to really tell people how, how little we know how fast this field is moving, and my my sort of academic hero is Professor Michael Cam, who's who's there's I've got two heroes, Professor Cam and also Tom Barodi, who's yes. who's he's the most he doesn't think out of the box, he thinks right out of the factory that yeah, makes the box. You know, he's, right. like, he's an amazing man. <laughs> but 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 um, Professor Cam has said to me that he believes that the manipulation and understanding of the microbiome is going to offer the same breakthrough in medicine that we received from the discovery of antibiotics. And and he's not a, a man who is given to to wild flights of fancy. He's one of the, the best gastroenterological scientists the world have, has ever seen. And and that's what he believes. And he's doing research which is which is mind blowing. We I was fortunate enough to be part of one of his research, research projects where we looked at ulcerative colitis and injecting stool into patients, donor stool into patients with ulcerative colitis. And the extraordinary data, which which was published in 2017 in um, Lancet Journal, showed that that injecting stool into patients has the same sort of effect in in stopping ulcerative colitis and controlling it as your things like steroids and anti-TNF antibodies, the best drugs we can give, the stool has the same sort of effects. So it's, it's, it's a genuine effect. And obviously, you know, it, it seems to be well accepted now about C. diff um, associated diarrhea and related illness, but, but um, there was even a fight with that 
you know, there was the, the orthodoxy pushed back, I remember, and now it seems like, oh, no, it's okay. But how hard is it to get the acceptance to move forward with the use of FMT, faecal mi- microbiota transplant, um, for other conditions? Like, uh, obviously, you've got to be cautious because, you know, uh, are you infecting them with something? So how do you know who to choose and and exactly. what, you know, how fast do you push ahead or how cautiously do you push ahead? That is exceedingly difficult because because of particularly the neurological type diseases of Parkinsonism. There's some evidence that it's important in Parkinsonism, schizophrenia, in MS. There's there's lots of diseases where this could be very, very important. Yeah. And and patients have formed advocacy groups and I get confronted and have been confronted by patients saying, I've got difficulty to treat MS. I want you to do a fecal transplant. The data just isn't there. We know there's there's two diseases where the data is good. Clostridium difficile, and Professor Tom Barodi three or four years ago said to me that if you don't give patients fecal transplant for resistant Clostridium difficile, you will be medically legally responsible. It is the standard of care, and there is no doubt about it. So, so fecal transplant for C. diff, yes, that is the best for recurrent C. diff, not for first-time C. diff patients. But recurrent C. diff, 91% of these patients do very well and get cured. For ulcerative colitis, it certainly has a role. Uh, do we do we give it first up? Definitely not. We try other things, the conventional stuff. But that that is definitely Professor Cam uses it in his clinic, and and the data is excellent. It works very well, and it it certainly doesn't seem to be dangerous in in that setting. To use it in other diseases, irritable bowel disease. There was a meta analysis recently which said that it could have some effect. I think it's too early. Crohn's disease even. I'm not totally sure that there's really strong data for Crohn's disease. And then for all these other neurological type diseases, there does seem to be something happening there. The the autism spectrum debate is is extraordinary. Mm. And the, the data there is is very good, but but things like Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis, various other immune mediated diseases, you know, hepatitis, for instance, alcoholic hepatitis, fatty liver disease. We know that fatty liver disease or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is becoming the main yes. reason for for liver failure and cirrhosis. We've sorted hepatitis C out. Alcohol is still a big deal, but but fatty liver in in the US and in this country, thirty percent of patients in Queensland yeah. have fatty liver disease. That's going to be the huge explosion of liver failure is going to be driven by fatty liver disease. And these organisms are certainly important. The microbiome seems to be crucial in the development of fatty liver disease, type 2 diabetes, all these types of metabolic diseases. Obesity, the microbiome plays a very important role there. How can we change the microbiome? We're not sure. Uh, We know how to do it, but is it justified? Do we get, by doing a fecal transplant, do we get long-term changes in the microbiome? Probably not. Do we use the, the fecal transplant route, the sort of Yucky injecting it into the colon, which which I do, that's a, a very powerful way. It's a genuine transplant. It's like almost like a blood transplant. You transplant feces into the into the colon of of a, of a patient. The the newer way of doing it is to give ta- tablets, but you know, do you get the same dosage? Do you get yeah, the same effect? Right. We're not sure. It seems to be. It seems to work. What does the future hold for us? Probably. Sophisticated culturing techniques, probably, you know, bespoke type type capsules that you can get. They call them capsules, yes. but capsules with with specially designed organisms in them to address certain things. But but it's it's absolutely fascinating. Oh, absolutely. Just as an, as an aside, we know we treat people with encephalopathy. Let's say you you you've got cirrhosis. You're an alcoholic. You've got encephalopathy, so your brain is affected by your by your alcoholism. We've treated these patients for decades using something called lactulose, yes, which is a sugar that gets Manitone. into the gut and that ferments in the gut. We've always thought that lactulose works by making you know people go to the toilet and emptying out the toxins. Probably not. It changes the microbiome, and one way of changing a microbiome in a positive way is to take a bit of lactulose. That's that's extraordinary. 
shortly, I learned that the other day in the lecture given by a fantastic microbiologist called Georgina Hale, and she just taught me so much there. So we're learning all the time. It's 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 surprising, you know. It's, well, it's, it's actually really exciting. Yeah. But but you've always got to be a little bit frightened of hype. There's a lot of hype and a lot of overselling, and 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 we've got to recognize that this is an important and a big field. We've got to recognize that we know very, very little. We're not even scratching the surface of the surface. We've got to recognize that we know virtually nothing about these atypical or extraordinary different sort of tiny organisms like the archaea and the CPR group of organisms. We know very little about them and how they interact with other bacteria. And, and you know, the, the, the future is out there. And we know that we can change the microbiome. We can change it by by changing our diet, by changing our lifestyle. We can use certain probiotics, although the, the data there is a little bit limited. Yeah. Well, that's that's one thing that I'd love to scratch the, the surface with, the, if we can get you back on to FX Medicine at a later stage, Johan. I'd love to. Indeed. Thank you so uh, much, though, for joining us today. Like, I must admit, like, I listened to a podcast with you and uh, Dr. Sam Manger on the GP show, and I was absolutely riveted by what you were saying. I'd also um, urge our listeners to listen to that link, and we'll put that link up on the FX Medicine website for everybody to access, Um, because, you know, you covered so much there, and I would love to cover a lot more with you, including where probiotics are indicated and where the Uh, evidence is lacking and just how cautiously we need to tread, but also other things that we can treat with faecal microbiota transplant, where the sort of evidence is is leading it. So I'd love to um, explore that on another episode, if that's okay with you. Well, thank you. I I, I just need to say as a final sort of sentence that that it's, it's genuinely exciting. And I think this is a genuine breakthrough and, and it, it, it's humbling as a as someone who's been in gastroenterology for a long time that that we've sort of missed everything that we've it's, it's only now that we've come across it the first time i came across fecal micro fmt was when i was giving a lecture about 15 years ago and i came across that article by tom Barodi where he was treating ulcerative colitis by putting stools into stool samples into patients and and i presented it to my audience and everyone burst out laughing yeah. And I sort of said, there's this guy, Tom Barodi, who's doing this. And it's crazy, but the data are fantastic. Yeah. And that reminds me of the, a quote by Neil Spur, the famous you know, uh, quantum scientist, who said, this idea is so crazy, it might actually be true. And that's what we're looking at. We're looking at this crazy idea that things growing in your gut change your brain and change your liver and change your everything. It's extraordinary. It's very exciting. Very exciting to have you on the show. Dr. Johan van den Boged, thank you very much for joining us on FX Medicine today. Thanks for that. Bye. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. This podcast is brought to you by the ATMS, the Australian Traditional Medicine Society.